When I was first building the Preact site, um, I had it kind of all client side rendered. We weren't yeah. doing any pre-rendering or anything. We are now, but uh, at the time, I you know I did that, and we weren't super concerned with SEO at the time, uh, which immediately vanished. <laughs> um, and I, I was definitely worried when we first pushed it live. Like, is this just going to be like, uh, you know, a title on Google search mm -hmm. with no body right. content? Yeah. Um, so I was kind of confused with that. And then there was other weird things like we were doing client-side routing, and in response to the client-side routing, we would change the meta tags for, mm -hmm. uh, for the description right, stuff. Yeah. No idea whether that gets picked up in Google search. Hello and welcome to another episode of SEO Mythbusting. With me today is Jason Miller. I'm really excited to have you here. So Jason, what do you do for work? Uh, I'm a DevRel on the Chrome team. Cool. So yeah. what do you work on? Uh, I work on a bunch of APIs in Chrome and sort of test them out. Cool. And you, you build Preact as well, right? I do build Preact on the side, oh, yes. Oh, that's a cool thing. So now that I've got you here, let's talk about SEO and frameworks. Sure. So I guess there's like a bunch of misconceptions about how frameworks and SEO come together. Yeah, and um, it would be a perfect opportunity to get them all myth busted. There's definitely a conception that uh, search engines don't run in JavaScript, mm. just across the board. Wow. Um, okay. And I'm not 100% sure where that comes from. <laughs> uh, I think maybe, you know, back in the, you know, in the early days of the web, it wasn't a thing. Um, that's true. So and, I mean, there's still probably cases where you know some other engines don't. So maybe that's like uh, it's pervasive because of that. Mm, that makes sense. That makes sense. I mean, we do still have crawlers and engines out there that are not executing mm. JavaScript. Is there anything that that you wonder or worry about in terms of discoverability? Yeah, definitely. So like, if if you build uh, an app where the HTML payload is a script tag and a style sheet. <laughs> you laugh. This is every yeah, app. <laughs> that is that is true. That's what happens. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I mean. Besides the, the user implications that this has, because obviously the browser then has to fetch more content and yep. you look at a blank page for a little longer, that also does affect the crawlers a little bit, especially okay. the ones that are not actually executing JavaScript. Definitely. I can speak for those, but I can say that Googlebot does execute JavaScript, so we do see your content unless there's some good reason not to see your content, like JavaScript errors or network errors happening. Okay. I, I did see in the uh, in the CDS talk you did, mm -hmm. there was uh, a new feature in Search Console that you guys were talking about yes. for errors? Yes, I, yes. So I don't know if you've ever used the fetch and render in Search Console beforehand. To get a screenshot, yes. To get a screenshot. Yes. So what do you do when you get a blank screenshot? Uh, cry. Yeah, that was, yeah. I feel you. <laughs> so um, one way of working around that is to use the mobile friendly test, which is the tool that we brought out. It does okay. what it says it does in the name. Like it tells you <laughs> if your page is mobile friendly, which okay. is fantastic. But more importantly, is it also gives you a list of the resources that we couldn't fetch for whatever reason. Oh, cool. And it gives you the, the console logs. All of them? All of them. Including cool. stack traces. What? Yeah. Okay. So you can actually debug. So you get a blank screenshot, and you're like, oh, no. But then you can go to this, uh, the console and see why. And so what we are doing right now is we are working on the new Search Console that also contains a thing that we call the URL inspection tool. Okay. That's part of the Search Console. And for every page that you have on your site that you verified for, because we don't want to serve that data to the public. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yes. Show me you like, know, Google search. search exactly. Show me, show me your Google search data. <laughs> so we try to have like one stop solution for pretty much everything. Right now, that includes when we last crawled you, if it's <laughs> on Google or not, if there has been any issues with, uh, I think, mobile friendliness um, or AMP. But oh, cool. yes, but yeah. it's going to be extended to like um, structured data okay. and also to JavaScript errors, I think. Ah, so. Okay. So what, in we mentioned like the features thing. Like, what features can I count on being available in the crawler? So we do parse HTML. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Right. That's a that's a mind blowing one. Um, we are stateless. Hmm. So that means we are basically pretending to be an incognito browser that opens the tab for each yeah. URL that we're indexing so the first time. Local storage, that kind no, of stuff. Local storage. Well, we do store cookies, but basically when we visit, when we go from one page to another, these cookies are cleared. So you can't really rely on cookies to be available across. Right. Uh, we're not running WebGL. 
Okay. Yeah, I don't think we are rendering what's on the canvas. I'm not sure about that. You can't really honest. search it anyway, right? That's that's the thing exactly. Everything in there is inaccessible to pretty much every user who's using assistive technology. Right. And you can think of a crawler as a user that needs assistive technology to understand the content. I'm curious if let's say like I'm, this is a super biased question, but let's say I built a website using uh, a framework that ends in ACT, um, one of the many. Uh, <laughs> So let's say I, you know, I built a website using whatever technology, client side rendering. Right. Um, and I'm doing like push state routing using mm -hmm. the history API. Uh, does Google pick up on push states? Yes. Yes, yes we do. So uh, because you give us a proper URL, right? Right. You have Hopefully. like example.com <laughs> slash blurb slash listing or something like that. So we do pick those up. If you use hash based routing, we don't pick them up. So please do not use push state routing. History API is the way to go. So if you use proper history API uh, URLs. However, don't fall for a thing that I have seen a few people fall for. You might test by basically loading your page from the home page and then clicking through. Mm. We are not doing that. Remember, we are stateless. So if I go straight to slash something, so if, if, you, if you use a URL and use a link to that URL yep. somewhere in your page, that's fantastic. But make sure that people can enter right there. Right. Interesting. So you may have to make sure that the server understands how to serve this. One way of doing it is doing like um, using a server that actually serves the index HTML for all routes, and then the JavaScript displays the right content. That is perfectly fine. Right. Just don't give us a 404 or 4500 or something like that. Right. Okay. Yeah. So like um, a bunch of the services, like I, I'm super lazy and deploy all my stuff to CDNs. Likewise. And, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so they let you do like a 200.html, and it's just like it returns that content for any URL that's not a file. That is fantastic. I did fail for something once. Um, you might use like a, a static site uh, thing that you can On use to, yeah, like GitHub Pages yep. or S3 or whatever, doesn't matter. Um, they also give you the possibility to do a custom 404 page, right? Mm. And I have abused that to like serve all because I didn't know all my routes up front. <laughs> so I'm like, yeah, you know, if it finds a route that it doesn't know, it serves this 404 but HTML. Is, is the status code 404? Yes, and that's why it's not being indexed then. Uh, yeah. So it's it's an error page that is actually yeah. very useful. Yeah, but you shouldn't be doing that because if if you give that to a crawler and say like this is not a page, then we are not picking it up because you told us not to. So you you said like if I'm using HTML links or whatever, mm. I can link between pages. That's fine. What if I'm using? Don't judge me for this. Uh, <laughs> a button, and the button has a click handler, and that click handler, that click handler <laughs> calls push state. I'm not saying I'm doing this. Okay. I'm not saying I'm not doing this. Let me guess. A friend of yours does right. that. Right. Yes. Mm. Uh, uh, <laughs> what's, a, what's a name? Bob. Yeah. Bob. <laughs> Boop. Boop. <laughs> Boop uses buttons um, <laughs> and on-click handlers. Poor Bob. You clearly do not do that. <laughs> no, I would never do that. And I'm very happy that you're not doing that right. because your friend really needs to use links for that. Right. Because links are to go from A to B. A right. button triggers an action. I think as you can use buttons and on-click handlers for all the things that are like, I don't know, doing a pop-up or something. Modal. Because yeah, modals or uh, even like trigger a function, trigger a countdown, whatever. If it's an action that happens on the page, that's a button and that's perfectly fine. But if it takes you to another piece of content and you want to make this content accessible via search and make it discoverable in search engines, if it has a URL, it should be a link. Okay. Right. So, so if, like if I had a modal that had a, like high value content in it or whatever, and it, right now it's just a button with a click handler that shows a thing on the page. Mm. If I want that to actually have like a representation in the search results, yeah. give it a URL. Then give it a URL. Make it a yes, link. Yes. You, what you can always do is so I, I like the idea of exposing some of the application state in mm. the URL. So you can basically say like, um, and we support parameters. So you could basically go like I don't know slash uh, action question mark modal or pop-up equals true. Okay, yeah. And if you use a link to go to that one, and then that means that it displays the thing. It, basically, you have to understand that search results work like as if you would take the, a URL, copy that into your messenger, right. and someone else tapping on the message on whatever device you don't know. So basically, they start a fresh browser, have never been to your page. Right. Do they see what you're seeing? If that's the case, then that's an indexable URL. Right, because otherwise, like if I had a modal, and let's say Google somehow crawled it, um, if you click on a link from Google Search, how does the link open the modal? That's the, the thing. Exactly, it has to it has to make it happen for the user because if that's a mismatch, then oh, what's the point? Another situation like that is, is infinite scrolls, right? Right. 
don't you hate it when someone sends you a link and then goes like, did you see like that bird? And then you look at it and it's like, the what bird? Oh yeah, you have to scroll for a while. You have to scroll 600 meters down the page, yeah. or uh, 400 feet or whatever. Yeah, I, 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 use, I use a metric system. Oh, good, I don't, good. Thank you very much for, ah, uh, hmm. Yeah. I think more people should do that. <laughs> So yeah, if you scroll down like 600 meters on a page um, to find the content, that's a that's an issue to like but surface that. If you could link to it, if there's like an anchor on it, now you then got you're good. It. exactly. If it's if it's an anchor, um, and specifically if you're using push state to like update the URL and then allow the JavaScript to pick that up oh. when you come back into the site and, and load the right content for it, you're off really well. So it's almost like uh, like you're you're doing virtual scroll, but the Google search bot almost sees it as like next and back buttons. Kind Pretty of thing. much, like, yeah. You, that's that's kind of like, like the offset. modality that you, exactly you give it an offset, and then we're like, okay, so now our JavaScript starts at like page five, and then you're good. And then Google bot comes and goes like, oh, so there's a link here with page five. All right, so in that case, it surfaces these twenty five images. The bird being the third one. Off we go. Okay. That's a, that's a good way of doing it. So let's say I was. Uh, like driving a page with a worker, like mm -hmm. I have like a worker that's doing all of my state management, or uh, you know even doing DOM rendering or something crazy. And uh, in order to actually get like pixels on the screen, I have to round trip through that worker and get all the HTML and you know, DOM manipulation back onto the main thread. Is is the fact that that might take a little while going to be a problem for Googlebot? Generally speaking, no. I'm. Definitely encouraging to test that carefully <laughs> using the tools that we've got available okay. to make sure that everything works the way you expect. But basically, if you see the content in the, so we the mobile friendly test also gives you the uh, rendered HTML that we are using for indexing. Oh. So you can use that to see like if it appears. The, normally, if it takes a little bit of time, that doesn't matter that much because okay. we're doing wonky, interesting things with time anyways. Because we have to deal with like a bunch of interesting we situations. We just take a while to load page, exactly. Right? Yeah. Okay. So don't worry too much about the time it takes. Um, if it's a little fragile, um, you will find out using the tools. The HTML that it shows, is that, like if I've done DOM manipulation, mm -hmm. is that after the DOM manipulation? Yeah. Oh, OK, so yeah. it's like a snapshot. Yeah, and if, if you're not seeing it, then something has gone sideways. OK, so even if I didn't have the error reporting thing, I mean, yeah, I want yeah. the error yeah, reporting yeah. thing, but even if I didn't have the error reporting thing, you I can You still see have the rendered HTML that you can deduct from what we're indexing, so. OK, that works. I can live with that. That's pretty cool. <laughs> All right. cool. Anything else from the top of your head? Is there any difference? So, like, uh, if, when I'm picking a framework or trying to figure out uh, you know, how I'm going to build my front end stack, mm -hmm. is there much of a difference between like framework sizes and approaches for how those might get crawled? So, when we're talking about like crawl budget, which means how often and how quickly we can crawl, the frameworks don't have that much of a difference because we are not like discriminating or preferring any of those, and, and we are not like looking at we're not too looking too much at the size really. So, okay. um, generally speaking, the more requests you do to get the content together, the more requests we count towards like that we have done a, a thousand requests, and if like each page of your content makes a hundred requests, that's literally like ten pages. Right. So it's also a usability thing, basically, if you think about it, being on a flaky network. Right. Uh, yeah, not nice slow. to get half-baked content or like get no content at all and only the empty shell. So it, it makes sense to look into server-side rendering or hybrid rendering to minimize the amount of requests that it takes, because that helps you with the crawl budget sometimes. But that being said, crawl budget is a really tricky topic, because right. we cache stuff. So if we have the mm. content already in the cache, it doesn't so, count towards it. Yeah, like if your home page loads all this stuff, mm. and then on, like all your product pages or whatever are just hitting the cache, maybe you're slipping under the crawl budget. That might happen, exactly. And crawl budget adjusts all the time yeah. anyways, because we want to make sure to not overwhelm your server. So Interesting. Jason, it has been a fantastic conversation. Thank you so much for, for being here, and really looking forward uh, to what you're building next. Cool. And um, thanks a Have lot a for being on the show. Thanks. In the next episode of SEO Mythbusting, Dion Alma is going to join me to talk about the web platform and SEO and all the road that lies ahead of us. So do not forget to subscribe to the Webmasters channel.